So we are working through signal generation in a neuron. Um, and we've gone through this idea of electrical potential, um, which is that difference of charged particles on either side of the membrane. And when you have a difference across some barrier, that difference in charged particles can generate a flow. So in the battery, it's a flow of electrons. In our biological system, it's in a flow of these things called ions. And just real quick, make sure everybody's up to speed on the ions. Those are just simply molecules or atoms that have a charge. You just either have an extra electron, which would be a negatively charged ion, or they are missing an electron, which would be a positively charged ion. So if we can have these in the positively and negatively charged ions in different concentrations on either side of our barrier of the cell membrane, then we can generate flow when that membrane is made to be permeable for that specific ion. And that flow is what generates current. And just like in our example of the battery, current, or the battery is used to generate a current because that current can be used to perform work. Things like turning the lights on. Now, you probably have all heard before, in reference to the battery, that the battery has two different poles. Right? It has a positive side, which we call the positive pole, and it has a negative side, which we can call the negative pole. The reason we call it a pole, P-O-L-E, is because poles are on opposite sides of an object. We have the north and south pole. The north pole is on the opposite side from the south pole. The negative pole of the battery is on the opposite side of the positive pole of the battery. Membranes also exhibit poles. And in terms of the biological membrane, that difference in ions, the, the concentration differences across the barrier, is what generates our poles. And we can actually refer to the whole, the whole thing collectively as being polar ions. So as you look at this figure here, this is just a portion of a neuron. And you can see that I have a very large amount of potassium on this side of the membrane, a lower amount of potassium on this side of the membrane. So they are polarized. They're opposite. High potassium inside, low potassium on the outside. Okay. So specific to our neurons, their differences in ion concentration across the membrane is what we have to maintain in order for this neuron to remain charged. Just like our battery, we want to keep our battery charged so we can turn our flashlight on when we hear spooky noises at night. We want to keep the neuron in this charged state, or we want to keep it polarized. We want to maintain potassium at high concentrations inside the cell, potassium at lower concentrations outside of the cell. When the neuron is in that resting state where it has differences in the charged ion concentrations across the barrier, that's what we call the normal which is usually referred to as the starting point for most biological systems. Normal is always your reference, right? So when you go, when you are sick, you're no longer normal, you're patho, pathophysiological. And it's a deviation from the normophysiological. So normal is the term we use in biology to describe the typical. So the normal is going to be, in this case, a resting state. And we want to have at that rest, when the neuron is not in use, a charged neuron. We want the neuron to be polarized. The way we polarize is by having that potential. So in this case, we call this the resting membrane potential. So the resting membrane potential is what we need to maintain in order for that cell to be considered 
charged, ready to generate a current to do work. And you can see, this is an example of the resting membrane potential. You can see that at, at rest, you're going to have a low concentration of sodium inside, a high concentration outside. That's why the, the, the size of the pot there is different. It's representing that it's smaller here and it's much bigger here on the outside. We have a very low number of these anions. Those are things like DNA, RNA, and protein. So a low number of those negative carrying molecules outside the cell a much larger number inside the cell. Potassium is very high in the cell, very low outside the cell, and then chloride is low inside the cell, and it's high outside the cell. So each of these, as you look through it from the exterior to the, of the cell to the interior of the cell, you have defined concentration gradients. So at rest, we want to make sure we maintain those concentration gradients. The resting membrane potential for a neuron, it settles right around minus 70 millivolts. What would be the resting potential of a charged battery? Double A battery. Anyone know when you look at double A battery, what is the voltage on it? That's what I'm asking. 1.5 volts. This is analogous to what we see here, minus 70 millivolts. Why is it minus? The reason that it's minus is we always reference from the inside of the cell. So the inside is our reference point. The minus means that it's more negative in the cell at rest. So in other words, those anions at rest have a much bigger influence on the charge of the intracellular fluid, the charge of the inside of the cell. So it settles out right around minus 70 millivolts. This is a charged system that's ready to perform work. If it was zero millivolts, that would be completely depolarized. It would be equal concentrations on the inside and outside of the cell, no concentration gradients. That's the dead battery. There's no ability to do work at zero millivolts if that's what we we're resting at. You go and put that battery inside of your kid's toy and it will pulse it. Now, this minus 70 millivolts, we have to maintain it. And hopefully, you all realize by this point in your life that biological systems have a tendency to fall into disarray. In gross terms, we call it aging, and all of you are getting older, and you're increasing to be about 30, and you're going to realize that you're not invincible anymore. For guys, you'll make it to like 26 and 27, you still feel like you're invincible. Ladies, about 25, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm not invincible anymore. Right now, you all probably still need to be invincible, but you're not. You're going to scratch yourself, and it's going to be a little tiny scratch. You're going to look at that. Six weeks later, though, this hasn't healed. I used to heal in three days when I was a kid. And it's because everything falls from order to disorder. That includes neurons that we want to maintain at resting and rate potential. They are always decharging. So we have to work to maintain the resting and rate potential at minus 70 millivolts. So what I want to go through now is how we form and maintain our resting membrane potential, which I'm just going to abbreviate as the RMP. I always call it the RMP, resting membrane potential. All right, so to really understand how we can do this, we've got to know a little bit about the barrier. So in this case, it's our cell membrane. By the way, why do you put a battery inside the freezer? Ever do that? And you use your batteries really quick. If you buy a pack of batteries, you know, it comes with like 400 AAA batteries or AA batteries in the package. You never buy just a couple of them. You know, you know, it's the cheapest, right? And you're not going to use all of them at the same time. They have an expiration date it's typically about 10 years out. But if you put it in the freezer, you can actually make that expiration date move out a little bit further. And you can keep the battery charged longer. The reason that is is because you have this little paper barrier. So it now gets to the cell membrane. Inside of our battery, oh, 
inside of our battery, positive and negative, we have that paper barrier. Molecules are constantly moving, right? Even this table, the molecules are moving, they're just moving really, really slow. In a battery, those molecules are moving, and some of them are actually not crossing through a circuit, but they're actually going directly to that barrier. Now, it's a very low amount, but if I go through that barrier, eventually that battery is going to discharge. Right now, it's about 10 years for that to happen. But if you put it inside of a freezer, it slows everything down, right? When, when water is cold, it becomes ice, it becomes solid, and that is just really a reference to the fact that the molecules of water to form that ice have slowed down significantly from their water or their uh, liquid or their gas stage. So you put a battery inside of a freezer, and you're reducing how much those molecules are moving around. They don't cross the barrier as frequently because they're moving slower, and you can maintain the difference across that barrier for a longer amount of time, 12 years or 15 years. Now, in our biological system, I could do the same thing. I could make it really cold, but who wants to be really cold if you're looking for oxygen, right? So we actually aren't going to do that. But it's analogous to, to, to putting it in the, into the freezer. We're actually going to put in work to make sure that the molecules that do cross get put back into the other side. So the cell membrane is critical here. Because this is the barrier. This is what separates. This is what separates the intracellular fluid, that fluid on the inside, and the extracellular fluid, the fluid that surrounds the cell. Okay? So to maintain my resting memory potential, I want to make sure that I have a high volume or a high number of sodium molecules on the outside, a lower number on the inside. But they are going to leak, just like in our example in the battery, sodium is going to begin to leak into the cell. And that's going to cause that concentration difference to slowly equalize if we don't do something. And we're decharging that resting membrane potential. So the cell membrane is what separates the intracellular fluid from the extracellular fluid. We refer to it as a selectively permeable membrane. And that selectively permeable nature of the membrane just simply means we can choose what's going to cross at a specific time. Now, it's not perfect. Sodium is going to cross directly through the membrane. And so the membrane is actually a little bit weak. And if we allow it to just leak without counteracting that leak, we're going to decharge or we're going to discharge that, uh, that membrane. Now, selectively permeable means that even though I have a small amount of leak, I can counteract it really, really efficiently if I choose to move sodium back in the other direction to counter that leak from outside to inside. I can bring the sodium back out. I can select to bring it back out in a high number of molecules. And I can do that really, really efficiently. Selectively permeable because not of anything to do with the lipids of the membrane, but everything to do with the proteins. We have proteins that are called channels that make the membrane selectively permeable. And these channels that are proteins, we're going to find bound in the membrane itself. So they are embedded inside of the membrane. And that's what you're seeing here. This is one of those channels inside of the membrane. And you'll notice that the sodium and the potassium, these arrows that are drawn here, Sodium leaks in, potassium leaks out. And actually, sodium leaks in relatively slowly, a small amount of sodium. Potassium leaks out quite a bit more. That's why the arrow is bigger there. So this is one of our channels. And what that channel does, in this case, is it allows my potassium and my sodium to be moved across the membrane. Okay. 
So this allows the potassium and the sodium to cross the membrane. So as potassium leaks out of the cell, I can pick it up by this channel and I can move it back in, counteracting the effects of that leakiness. And we'll get to there. We're going to talk about the physiology here in about five minutes. So that's just a little primer on the membrane. Two other, um, two other components here that we need to know about. The second component is the electrolytes. Again, these are going to be the things like sodium and potassium. And as I've already mentioned, these are dissolved in the fluid. And really what we're concerned about is the fluid that's right up next to the membrane. So not the fluid that's here in the middle, but the fluid that's right up next to the membrane, kind of that little volume of fluid that's within just a few small units of distance from the membrane. And those electrolytes, again, are always unequally distributed. And I'm going to give you some numbers here, and I'm going to give you a picture that will be very, very helpful if you can kind of draw it out and have it in your mind for answering these kind of questions. ECF is the extra soil fluid. Again, that's the fluid on the outside of the membrane. In terms of sodium, it's 145 milli equivalents per liter. Now don't get caught up on the term milli equivalents per liter, it's a chemistry term. Basically, just think of the 145, the, the milli equivalents per liter is equalizing all of this stuff to the same unit of measure. So 145 is what you're really worried about. Okay, so extracellular fluid sodium is 145. Potassium is four milli equivalents per liter. That's in the extracellular fluid. In the intracellular fluid, the sodium is 12 milli equivalents per liter, and the potassium is 150 milli equivalents per liter. All right. So I'm just giving you the numbers for extracellular fluid, intracellular fluid. Now let me give you a picture that will help to represent what's going on inside of the cell membrane. And if you remember this, you can draw this out on an exam, and then I'll have to answer questions. So that's my membrane. Just going to put in two lines representing the lipid bilayer. On one side, I'm going to have my extracellular fluid. On my other side, I'm going to have my intracellular fluid. Now, starting with sodium, sodium is always in a higher volume outside of the cell, a lower volume inside of the cell. Okay? So your concentration gradient for sodium at rest is going to favor the movement of sodium to the intracellular fluid. Potassium is just simply the opposite. Potassium is very low outside the cell, very high inside the cell, and favors the movement of potassium to the exterior of the cell. So when the cell membrane is made permeable to sodium or potassium, potassium leaves, sodium comes in. Now, in just terms of charge, Sodium has a positive charge. If I move a bunch of sodium inside of the cell into the intracellular fluid, what happens? Charge of that intracellular fluid. It becomes way more positive. What if I take a bunch of potassium and move it up? What happens to the charge of the intracellular fluid now? That's going to become more negative because I'm getting rid of a bunch of positives. Now, one more thing that I would add to this figure, on the intracellular side, I put a negative sign. 
And that represents my DNA, my RNA, and my protein, my ATP, those what are called immovable anions. These are big molecules that hold a negative charge that can't cross the membrane. And they have a really big influence when the cell is at its resting membrane potential and is what really accounts for the minus 70 millivolts. So let's also talk about those anions. So get that into your finger and let's talk more about those anions. Again, it includes molecules like RNA, proteins, certain acids, ATP, and DNA. And I call them immovable anions, and that's just simply because they're too big to effectively cross the membrane. So these are large molecules. DNA is a massive molecule in terms of a cell. And so it does not readily just cross through the membrane the same way the tiny molecule of sodium will. So we got to keep track of what's going on with the membrane, what's going on with our electrolytes, and what's going on with our anions to really understand how we maintain our resting membrane potential. So let's put the physiology behind that. So keep that figure in mind or keep it right there in your notes nearby so that you can reference to I'm going to tell you that potassium is the most permeable. That means that potassium crosses the membrane the easiest. And I'm talking about directly through the membrane. It doesn't require a channel or another protein. So it's the most permeable. Potassium leaks across the membrane. Okay, so potassium leaks across the membrane. As it leaks across the membrane, and since it's most permeable, it crosses that membrane pretty easy. Now, referencing your figure, how is that potassium most likely going to leak? It's going to leak out of the cell because we know potassium has its highest concentration inside the cell. The impetus to move is driven by the concentration gradient. So when it leaks through the membrane, it's traveling inside to outside. That's simply going to be down its concentration gradient. Now, remember we always reference charge based off of the intracellular fluid. So as my potassium leaks through my membrane, which is happening all of the time, what would be the consequence on the intracellular fluid? If we just ignore everything else and we're only thinking about potassium, we're not countering this, this potassium leakage. So potassium is leaking through the membrane, what's happening to the intracellular fluid. It's becoming more negative. Now, as the cell becomes more negative, so we're talking about it's supposed to be at minus 70 millivolts. It's not drifting towards minus 80, minus 90 millivolts. That negative charge it's ever increasing because of the uh, because of the leakage of potassium. That increasing negative charge is going to begin to exert a large. I'm going to put this in parentheses. I'm going to call it a large pull. What do we need to know about charge? Positive and negative charge. 
positives always attract negatives, and negatives always attract positives. So I'm increasing the negative charge inside the cell. It's exerting a larger pull on things that are positive. As the cell becomes more and more negative, I now am increasing the pull on positive. So what happens with this leak of potassium creating this larger pull on positive, I actually have some of that potassium that's escaped. It actually passes back into the cell. So I have kind of like this giant exodus of potassium in one direction, and then I have kind of a small influx of potassium because of the exertion of that pole. Those two things are going to balance out. I'm going to have this balancing out of the potassium that's leaving and then the potassium that's pulled back in because of the increase in the charge. So those two things, they balance out. And if we're only considering potassium, so we have the potassium that leaves, we have the potassium that comes back in because it's pulled by that increasing negative charge. And if we only consider the potassium, and we look at the concentration gradient, which would be what charges, uh, pushes the charge out. So we have that flow that's created because of the concentration gradient, a high concentration of potassium inside of the cell desiring to leave the cell because we always go from high concentration to low concentration. And then the electrical pole that's created these things will balance out with each other. And if we only consider potassium, so we ignore all other sodium and all of the other stuff inside of the cell, that balance of the concentration leaving, the concentration gradient causing the potassium to leave, and that electrical pull pulling some of the potassium back in, we would balance our SD membrane potential right around minus 90 millivolts. Again, only if potassium is involved. But we know from experimental data that the SD membrane potential of the neuron is minus 70 millivolts. So obviously there's something else that's going on, and there's going to be a couple of other things that are going on that are going to help to bring us closer to our minus 70 millivolts. So just from the potassium movement, it would be 90, 90, minus 90 millivolts. So something else is going on here as well. We have all of this. Now, if you're really thinking about this today, you're probably thinking, well, sodium's probably doing something as well, because we don't just have potassium, we also have sodium. And that's true. And in fact, sodium also crosses the membrane. Now, when sodium crosses the membrane, it crosses at a much lower amount. Because it's not crossing, it can't cross near as easily as the potassium. But if you were to take a guess, you hopefully are going to guess that sodium is probably going to travel down its concentration rate. So we have this small amount of sodium that comes into the cell. And so that's why the arrow here is much smaller. Sodium leaks into the cell. And the reason that it's leaking into the cell, in addition to being down its concentration gradient, it's also a positively charged ion. So when potassium leaves and we get that higher negative influence, Potassium comes in down its concentration gradient and is also pulled in towards that towards that negative um, charge inside the cell, minus 90 millivolts. So it's pulled also by the negative charge that's induced by potassium leak in the intracellular fluid. So we have a large amount of potassium that leaves, then a small amount that comes back in as we become more negative. Sodium also comes in because of the concentration gradient and also because it's pulled by that negative charge. And if we account for all of this now, so the effects of potassium, the effects of sodium, 
This reduces the negative charge. All things balance out. The reduce may not be the best there. It actually changes the negative charge inside of the cell, and it balances out right around minus 65 mole volts. Now it was still not at minus 70. So there's one additional mechanism that's going to help to get everything balanced out here so that we rest right at minus 70 millivolts. The last thing is the channel that exists called a sodium potassium pump. Now, a sodium potassium pump, if you think back towards the beginning of the semester, we talked about membrane transport. How do we get stuff through the membrane? And when we use the term pump, we always have to think energy, right? We pump, we put in energy to pump something from one location to another. So this sodium potassium pump is a protein channel that requires energy to work. So we're going to expend an ATP. We're going to use ATP as our energy supply. And every time we go through what I'm going to call a duty cycle, this is basically one pump cycle of a sodium-potassium pump. That sodium-potassium pump is going to pump three sodium molecules out of the cell, and it's going to pump two potassium channels, I'm sorry, two potassium molecules, rather, into the cell. Now, if you do the math there, you would be able to calculate that we have a net loss that's equivalent of one positive charge from the intracellular fluid for one pump cycle, one duty cycle. If we were ignoring the sodium potassium pump and just were uh, observing the potassium and the sodium dynamics, we had a resting membrane potential of minus 65. We are now losing one positive charge from the intracellular fluid with this sodium potassium pump. Now, there's literally millions of sodium potassium pumps that are embedded inside of membranes that are pumping three sodiums out, two potassiums in. And this is going to account for that kind of three to five millivolt decrease in the resting membrane potential. It's going to get us right down to about minus 70 millivolts. Now I gave you a range of minus 3 to minus 5 millivolts, and that's because we're going to have all of this affected by things like changes in temperature or changes in pH. As temperature increases or decreases, you change from 3 to 5 millivolts that the uh, sodium potassium pump is able to account for. So the real resting membrane potential, which is good if you know it as minus 70 millivolts for a neuron, the real resting membrane potential for that neuron is approximately minus 68 to minus 70 millivolts, depending on the condition of the sun. So let's just call it minus 70 millivolts for our RMP, our resting membrane potential. Now, that sodium potassium pump, you guys are all actually very aware of your sodium potassium pumps. Not that you know them personally, but you are very aware because you all probably can estimate that you eat between 18 to 2,000 calories every day. And 50% or more of the caloric intake that you consume goes towards producing ATP to operate all of the different sodium potassium pumps in all of your different cells throughout the nervous system, the skeletal muscle, the heart, all of the different tissues. So you expend a lot of energy from your 2,000 calories in your diet. You're using 50% of those calories to generate ATP molecules so that you can operate successfully in sodium potassium pumps. <coughs> Thank you.
Okay, this next section of notes here is how do we actually utilize something like a neuron to do work. And we have to initiate something called a graded potential that will disrupt the resting membrane potential. So we can actually measure, we use something very similar to a voltmeter. Obviously, it's not like the voltmeter that you may measure your current or your voltage in your car, but it's the same concept. We have a negative and a positive electrode, and we put them on either side of the barrier. So we're going to insert one of these probes through the membrane of the neuron, leave the other one out in the solution that's bathing that neuron, and we can actually keep track of what happens in terms of voltage inside of the cell. Now, when we go to create a what's going to be called action potential, which is the signal that moves up and down the neuron, we have to disrupt our resting membrane potential. We've got to take our minus 70 millivolts, and we have to disrupt it to a point that we're going to call threshold, and that threshold is going to be basically what turns the whole system on to generate a signal. I'm going to get this all fleshed out here for the next couple of minutes. Just suffice it to say that we got to take that minus 70 millivolts and we have to disrupt it. We have to get it up towards like minus 45 or minus 50 millivolts, and then things are going to start to happen. That graded potential is going to be created by an incoming signal. So, real quick, somebody give me an example of where I'm making an incoming signal. Right now, y'all can see me, right? What sounds of light are bouncing off my clothes, the color of my pocket. One second. So, blue. For being a topic, blue. Light's coming from the lights, bounces off to the tie at a certain frequency, hits your eyes. Your eyes respond to those photons of light, those little packets of light to create a graded potential. They then send the signal into your central nervous system. If I were to shake your hand, you'd feel my hand over my finger hand. That's a signal that creates a graded potential that sends a signal back into your central nervous system and you process that information. You can think of all sorts of things now, I'm sure. It's kind of the stomach of your hand over the because that's even a graded potential. Okay, so before I take that any further, we're going to have incoming signal, and they're called sensations. And they're all around us, and we interact with them on a daily basis. They create these things called graded potentials, and the graded potential, really that signal, all it, do, all it is doing is it's taking that resting membrane and the voltage and causing it to change. And so when we look at our minus 70 millivolts, there's only really two ways we can change, right? We can become more positive, or we can become more negative. When the resting membrane potential decreases or becomes more negative, this is said to cause hyperpolarization. Remember, polarization is this idea that things are opposite on two different sides of an object on the globe. Our poles are the north and the south pole, and they're different. Our political landscape right now, we say it's very polarized. We have extreme conservatives, extreme liberals, and they have two very different sets of values and morals and views. In the membrane, we have a difference on either side of that. Uh, I'm sorry, in the cell, we have a difference on either side of the membrane. And that membrane can be made to be more polar or hyperpolar. So if it becomes more negative, more positive on one side, even more negative on the other side, it hyperpolarizes.
if we increase and become more positive, that's supposed to be a minus sign here, not an arrow. I'm sorry. So if you decrease or become more negative, this is hyperpolarization. If we increase the intracellular fluid or become more positive, we're becoming more positive relative to that positive side of the membrane. So millivolts is going from minus 70, minus 40, and eventually we can get up to zero. Zero would be completely depolarized. So when we become more positive, this is depolarization. So when you disrupt the resting membrane potential to produce a signal that can go to the can go to the central nervous system, you have to depolarize the membrane. So you can see here's two different graphs. If from the resting membrane we become more positive, so we're going towards zero, that's a depolarization of that. Over here it becomes more polarized, that's a hyperpolarization of that. Okay? Think of this right here is getting ready to turn on the light switch. I maybe have done all the work to come over here and I'm now ready to turn it on. I haven't changed the work that's going to form that. I've got to turn the light on. I'm actually treating the work. I'm, I'm ready. I'm right here, sort of depolarizing it. I'm pushing the switch, depolarizing, depolarizing, then it can fully on. I'm completely depolarized. We now have work that's occurring. Now, when you get a stimuli that comes into a neuron, it causes depolarization to occur. Okay? So, whenever you have a stimuli, you have a little flip, a little increase in the voltage. We go from minus 70 millivolts up to like minus 69 millivolts, or minus 68 millivolts. So, you kind of get this little flip with the stimuli. Now, the thing that's Real interesting here about this is if you have repeated signals, repeated signal impulses that come in, each of those little impulses would cause their own little increase in the voltage. But they can stack on top of each other. So you're looking at my pie, it's a blue pie, and you have literally millions of protons, no, photons, millions of photons of light, little packets of light that are bouncing off of my eye and are hitting your eyes right now. So you can see it as blue. And every time one of them hits, you get a little flip, and then another little flip. And what happens is you go through this process called summation. So here's two little signals that come in, and they just increase, and then they decrease. And there's really no, no signal that's sent to the central nervous system. Then we get many of those signals all in a single amount of time, and we get an action potential. That action potential is now information that can be processed by the central nervous system, and it can say, hey, those are blue photons that are in your life. Dr. Bowman's tie today is a blue tie. So when you have repeated signal impulses that come in, or it could be repeated signal impulses like in you know, brush a paintbrush against your arm, and you would sense that. That paintbrush and, and the mechanical action of brushing your arm with a paintbrush increases the impulses to get sent into the central nervous system. At that point of contact, where you make contact, there are organs there, receptors that pick up and they change their characteristics, increase the voltage. So these signals can be added together in a process known as summation. And as you stack them on top of each other, which is shown really nicely here in this portion of the figure, if the signal, the, the second signal comes in before the first signal goes all the way back on pressing membrane potential, it gets stacked on top. And so you have this proportional change. in the signal's strength. 
So all of the sensations that you have around you right now are interacting with sensory tissues and sensory organs that you have all over your body. And those sensory tissues and sensory organs are creating these little reactions to the sensation. And if they get stacked up on top of each other, you get to this thing called threshold and something really magnificent happens at threshold. The thing that happens at threshold, which is reached when we have an increase in signal or an increase in depolarization, we reach that threshold. The magnificent thing that happens is we form something called an action potential. So it's a graded potential that disrupts the resting membrane potential because of the ability to sum things together. When we get to this point called threshold, we get this really big nerve impulse that we call an action potential. And we can now use this to move it physically along the membrane of a neuron to move the sensation here at graded potential the information up to your central nervous system. The action potential, the formation of the action potential is described by that sudden rise in voltage potential. <coughs> and that sudden rise in voltage potential is associated with the production of a current creation of a current. And that current is what's going to allow us to do work, which is to send a signal to the central nervous system as information to be processed in order that we can determine what actually is happening. Are you being stabbed or is someone just reaching out to shake your hand? During an action potential, the fluid, the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, right there up next to the membrane, goes through a sudden change. And the intracellular fluid near the membrane becomes more positive. So the membrane becomes more positive because of the change that's occurring there at the membrane. Now, why is it going to become more positive? What do you think is actually going to happen? when I create this great potential. How would, how would we become more positive already? How would we, how would we talk about it? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exchange those electrolytes or those ions across the membrane. So when you have a graded potential, you actually are going to have this initially a massive increase in voltage inside of the cell. The cell becomes massively more positive. Thinking back to your figure, what ion is going to create that change in voltage towards the positive direction? Sodium. Sodium is going to rush into the cell. How about on the other side, when we go back down to resting membrane potential, we go from our plus 30 millivolts down to minus 70 millivolts. Potassium is going to leave. So you have sodium followed by potassium that are going to account for the creation of the action potential. All right, I'm out of time. When we come back, we'll actually talk a little bit more about action potential formation and how we can move that action potential along a membrane.